Uh, we've got Taban Shoresh uh, with us this afternoon. Um, we're delighted to um, have Taban with us this afternoon. Taban has experienced something I think most of us in this room have not, and that has been kidnapped and held with a threat of death looming constantly. A political activist, Taban's father, drew attention from Saddam Hussein's men, and as a result, Taban's life and that of her family was changed completely. They moved to London in 1988, and this offered Taban many opportunities, which she grabbed with both hands. Um, a finalist in Red Magazine's 2017 Women of the Year, last September, a statue of Taban was unveiled in London, um, honouring the work she has done with her charity, Lotus Flower, which she established in 2014, and whose aim is to empower vulnerable women and girls so that they are safe, have opportunities to <coughs> learn, given the tools to become financially independent, and have the freedom to speak out and lead change. Um, I particularly liked the name of the charity for no other reason other than, I thought it was such a nice name, so <laughs> I had to look at it, and thankfully and helpfully it was on your website, and it said, the lotus flower is considered resilient and strong and grows in muddy water, only to blossom into something incredibly beautiful, which is a wonderful sentiment to the type of work Taban and her charity does. Um, I was also particularly taken, guess what I was doing last night? Um, <laughs> and we look at, you know, you look across different organisations, different businesses, and you look at their values and go, mm, yeah, they all kind of sound the same, but I really liked yours, and, it, and it's simple. It says, we believe in working from the heart with love and respect. And honestly, if we all do that on a daily basis, I think we would have it licked, and my easy thing of being able to turn the heat on is actually gets way down in there. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're very pleased to welcome um, Taban as one of our inspiring women, and uh, I'd like to give it a really good UWS welcome. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for having me here. Uh, I've been blown away by all the talks today already. I'm going to try and squeeze my very long, complicated life into 35 minutes. Um, please warn me if I've gone, gone over. And um, we can have some questions at the end as well. I don't really do presentations, but I've created one for this. Um, <laughs> So I guess the talk for me, and I, one thing, there are some take outs that I'd like you to take away by the end of the session, but for me, really, everything that I've lived from, I guess, from the moment I've been born to now, is that all the experiences that I've had has really, really embraced the great unknown, but it's only now that I've just realized that I have been embracing the great unknown. And hopefully when I talk about the stories and what I've gone through, you can see elements on where that has been applicable. Um, I, for those that are on social media, the, the, the handles for Twitter and Instagram. A little bit about me, so I'm going to come out here when I talk about this. I think um, it's, really, it's really difficult for me to do the presentation if I don't give you my story in full. Um, and that goes back to me being a ch childhood genocide survivor. So from the age of four, I was taken as a child political prisoner with my mum and grandparents, and this is because I'm Kurdish. And under Saddam Hussein's rule, um, anyone that was politically active uh, would be persecuted. And my father was politically active. He was a Peshmerga, but he was also a poet. So he had um, people uprising because of his poems, but he was also defending and fighting back against Saddam's regime. So for that reason, we were targets. And at that time, they would target families um, to bring down the men who were fighting. And I remember the day quite clearly. I was at my grandmother's house in the garden playing with my doll, and um, there was a loud thump at the garden gate. And it startled me, but my uncle ran out to open the gate. And as a child, you kind of see family and you run to safety. So I ran to him, thinking that there would be um, cousins or family members at the door, but when he opened the door, there was two Iraqi soldiers standing there. And they asked for my mother, because she had just left work. And the reason why she'd left work is because she would sneak out to see my father in the mountains um, without telling work, but she'd tell them that I was ill, my brother was ill. And when she'd return, she'd be interrogated to try and find out information to see if that she'd gone to see my father. 
Um, and she'd had enough of this. So she'd had enough of the interrogations and left work. And left, the day that she left work, they came to my grandparents' house to question her again. Um, and my uncle tried to deter the soldiers away by saying, oh no, she's left, he, she's left this, uh, her husband because of this child and tapped me on the head. And they looked down at me and said, oh, so this is her child. Um, and at that moment, I think he realized, well, maybe I shouldn't have said that. And my other uncles had seen what was going on and hid my brother in the basement where you have the window that's opposite the garden gate. So he witnessed us being taken away. Um, so they took us away. They took me and my mother. And when they opened the doors to the vehicle, uh, my grandparents were there, so my dad's parents, and all the adults were basically screaming, crying, wailing, begging them not to take me because I was only four years old, and they didn't know what was going to happen. We were driven to one prison um, where it was a normal prison, so you had normal criminals there, and it was very scary walking in because everyone would be staring at you, and they took us to a room where they interrogated the adults to try and get as much information out of them. They didn't give anything away because at that time, if you're part of the movement, you don't give anything away, even if it kills you. Um, so we were there for a few hours and then we were taken to um, another prison. And on the way there, they stopped and picked up a young boy who was blindfolded. And he was screaming and begging, please don't kill me, what's going to happen to me? And my grandfather was trying to console him um, to reassure him nothing would happen. The car stopped. The soldiers took him away and we never saw him again. But he was executed like a lot of other men at that time. When we arrived in our second prison, um, I do remember coming out of the vehicle and there were two buildings. There was a men's prison and there was a women and children's one. And the women and children's one, all the women kind of stormed through to the small windows to try and see who's new and who's coming. Um, as we walked in, my grandmother was the main person that was looking after me because my mum was too shocked and angry to be able to cope to look after me. We walked into the prison and it was absolutely packed with women and children, like back to back. There was no space. My mum had to fight for us to have space. And eventually, my, my, grandma, my grandmother and myself had space to sleep that night, but she sat up. There was no space for her. We were in prison for about two weeks until um, some family names were called out and our family name was on that list. I was too young to actually know what was going to happen, but I could gorge from the reaction to the adults that things weren't good. Um, we were taken outside of the prison and the adults again started screaming and wailing and I didn't know why, but it was because there was two diggers in front of the buses and they knew that they were going to be basically buried alive or we were all going to be buried alive. Um, so at that time, Saddam Hussein would have many, many forms of torture, and this was one of, and, and killings, and this was one of them. But the way that they would do it is they would take people and make them see the diggers, and then they would make people watch the hole being dug and throw everyone in alive, and then use the smallest thing they had, like a shovel, to throw soil over them. And that was a slow form of torture and death. Um, but we had a miraculous escape. At that time you had Kurds working for Saddam Hussein who were actually working for Kurds. You also had Kurds who were working for Saddam Hussein who were working for Saddam Hussein. We had experience of both, but the first one was um, some sort of deal had been made with two Kurdish men and we didn't know about this. So when we were driven in the buses, you know, everyone thought that they were going to their deaths. It was all silent whispers. And um, we stopped and there was some sort of deal that was made outside because then the buses started driving again and then it stopped again and they opened the doors and said we're Kurdish we're not going to kill you but you need to pretend as if you're dead because if they find you again you'll be killed on the spot um, so they did that we were taken to the end of the road my grandfather stopped a taxi which randomly was one of his old students and he said, what the, what the hell are you doing here with your family in the middle of nowhere? And you can't tell anything to anyone at that time. So he just said, don't ask any questions. Let's take us back to the city, sneak us in, and that's it. So we went back, and we went back to my mum's stepsister's house because we couldn't go back to any other house because they would be searched. So she, it's the least likely place to be searched. And when we walked in, everyone was wearing black, 
and in mourning and they had a funeral. It was actually our funeral that they were in because they'd been sent a message to say that we'd been very alive. Um, that must have been very surreal for my mum to walk into that. I'm too young to actually remember that moment. Although there are bits of my experience I remember very, very clearly. Um, we were told we had to go in hiding that night. And so we went to the south of Iraq where my mum had a stepbrother and we stayed there for three months. Now, I don't, speak, I don't speak Arabic, and so for me to go out in public would have been a massive giveaway. So I was locked in the house for three months. And my mum finally put her foot down and said, okay, we've got the death sentence on us. Um, I don't want to kill my children. You need to get us out of this country to my dad. And so eventually he agreed, but that meant months of fleeing, literally 12 months of fleeing. So we went from village to village and hiding, and this is during the Iran and Iraq war, so you're having bombs thrown at you in all the rural areas, and we'd get stuck in certain places, and I've seen more bombs, bullets, and injuries, and dead people than I should in my lifetime. Um, and so you, you got to, you were trying to survive death from that, but also from Saddam Hussein catching us. We were eventually smuggled into Iran, into safety, um, on horseback, and my dad was meant to meet us there, but he was still in Kurdistan, and Saddam Hussein had hired a husband and wife to poison a group of prominent men, and he was included in that. And what they did was they put poison in a yogurt drink that we have. So we're, in our culture, food is massive, very hospitable. If you go into a Kurdish house, you would be force-fed, literally. <laughs> and um, so the food was laid out, it was a massive feast, and for like peshmergas, it's a, it's a treat, you don't really get to eat like that. And the poison was in the yogurt drink on purpose because, you know, you, you invite someone around for dinner, you expect them to eat, so you will eat, so there's no suspicions around anyone eating, but no one's really going to watch you drink. So they put the poison in the yogurt drink, and the men that um, basically gulped it down died on the spot. And my dad and two other men were poisoned enough to be critically ill, and their friends managed to mix, smuggle them into Iran um, very quickly, and Amnesty International picked up on the story, and that's how he was flown to the UK to get medical treatment. I don't know if you remember that Russian spy that was poisoned, Litvienko, looked like him, basically. And so a year later, we followed. That's my story in a nutshell. <laughs> um, I think I've done that, yeah. So we arrived in the UK. So I still remember my plane ride to the UK. I've never been on a plane before, I've never experienced anything, not been exposed to any other cultures, no other people apart from Kurds. Um, so for us to land in the 1980s where men had long hair and you had different cultures, it was so, so new for us. Um, and so I think we just settled into life quite easily. It wasn't you know, there were challenges as a child and a refugee. Um, I remember particular moments, for example, there was a point where I was in the dinner line and I didn't speak English, but this, I knew four words that they were teaching us, and, you know. Um, and this girl, kids being kids, was quite mean. She turned around and said, your dad sat down her saying. And I couldn't respond, like, I couldn't verbalize what I wanted to say, so I pushed her, and the teacher saw me push her. So the teacher came stumping over to me and said, go to the back of the line. And I just burst out crying. I cried so much, but I couldn't respond and say, do you realize what Saddam Hussein's done to us? Um, that's why I pushed her. She can't call her my, my dad. Um, and so there were incidents like that, but then I had really nice experiences with kids as well. My first best friend was called Alex, and Alex would take time to teach me English from what the teacher was teaching me. And Alex had long hair, and I didn't know Alex was a boy until <laughs> we, went <to> <laughs> we went different changing rooms, and I thought, oh, Alex is a boy. So there was like, <laughs> you know, we had different experiences, but then went to school, went to university. Um, and I guess in, in my adult life, I've had equally difficult moments as well. Um, but I think from the childhood and moving here, embracing the great unknown was we've left or we've been forced to leave everything that we knew, um, everyone that we loved, but we still embraced it. Um, coming to a new country, new surroundings, we really did kind of settle in and integrate, and we had lots of amazing people supporting us. And so, uh, did the normal things that you do. I went to university. Um, well, actually, I got I got married very young. That was not 
a great thing. Um, and I had, so I got married at the age of uh, 18 or 19. And that was actually because as a diaspora, you go through a massive identity crisis and you're split between two cultures. And for me, my teenage years were very much defined in that. So I was split between a very British culture that I was in, and because of that particular moment of that um, dinner line, I never spoke about my past ever, so I tried to deny it. Um, and so being very British, I tried to integrate into everything else. And then you've got this cultural roots where your parents are like, this is your culture. And so you become so confused in your identity and as a teenager, and I think that's why I ended up getting married so young. But I got married to um, a very wrong person who took, you know, and those experiences are also why I help women and girls now. Um, I had my child at the age of 20, so my son's now 16 years old. He's like six foot four up there. Um, and also, I got Crohn's disease at that point, but my marriage was very, very difficult and very abusive. But I managed to keep that hidden from everyone and kept, kept it very, very hidden. So I was functioning in everything else that I was doing. I went back to university, um, made sure I got my studies, and kind of saw that as my escape. Um, but nobody could tell what was going on in my personal life. Within six and a half years of that marriage, I came out as somebody who couldn't talk to per the person one-to-one. -one. I couldn't look at anyone one-to-one. -one. I had no friends left. I had zero support or a network around me. My confidence was completely stripped away. So for me to stand here and to talk in front of an audience, that would never have happened. Um, and it was all because it was stripped away from one person and taken away from me. So the moment I left, I made a decision to rebuild myself, and it was very, very scary. I didn't know what to expect, but again, I just went, do you know what? I'm going to embrace this great unknown and figure out how I'm going to do it. And so over the next 10 years, um, I literally did that. I built myself back up one by one. And um, so I also had Crohn's disease, so I've been battling with my health as well, so you're trying to balance everything. And I ended up having a job in the city um, as a proper digital project manager. It was a really, I decided, you know, that's that a good paid job for a single mum. I went down that route. I had one very clear goal, which was as soon as my son finishes primary school, I'll know what I'm going to do. I'm going to do something. I just don't know what yet. Um, and I needed to buy a house, that, that, that security. So I had two goals. And I managed to reach that goal, and it happened to be at the same time as um, ISIS, when ISIS went into the Kurdistan, and um, the humanitarian crisis uh, started there. And April 2014, I was asked to speak at the House of Lords on Genocide Remembrance Day, and I've never spoken to in front of people ever before. I've never spoken about my experiences, so I was really, really scared. But in the city where I was working, um, they were doing presentation classes, so I joined up to a presentation class. And it, those dates collided, so I thought, what better way for me to practice what I need to do, but how do I do it? Nobody knows about my story. So I remember the session very clearly, and um, well, I walked in and the trainer said, okay, can you stand up and give us a presentation on social media or whatever it is that you do? So I did, and I think I was really disengaged. <laughs> Um, okay, let's start that again. Do something that is like more inspiring to you or attached to you. It could be personal, it doesn't have to be work related. And I thought, what do, what do I talk about? And for some strange reason, my brain just went into the moment I was taken to prison, that, that clear moment, because I remember it so clearly. And I just visualized it, and I talked through the visualization of what happened. And everyone in the room just went, huh? <laughs> what do you mean that's happened to you? I said, yeah, that, that's really happened. So that coach helped me um, do my presentation, and it was the same kind of response at the House of Lords where I just stood there and just spoke about what I saw in my head and described what I was seeing. And it managed to get standing ovation and cries, and I was completely overwhelmed by it. So when it took me aback and it made me realize, hold on, what am I doing? working in the city, like it <coughs> made me question everything. And I went back and while it was questioning everything, for some strange reason I thought, hey, 
let me ask my CEO, who I never have a meeting with, I don't really interact with at work, he's a really humble man, but for me, he was a visionary, like in terms of what he was doing for work, he, he was a visionary and he would see where he wanted to go, so I thought for some reason, he might be able to guide me. So I had a meeting and um, said, I don't really know what to do with my life, I don't know what direction to go, this is happening, I feel connected to my path, I feel like I should be doing something. And he turned around, and just, uh, it was such a heartwarming experience, he just turned around and said to Bam, too special for that corner desk, can you just please go and fly? I thought, I just, I needed to hear that, you know, even though I knew it deep down, for some reason just hearing it reaffirmed it. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I knew that I was going to leave, um, and the humanitarian crisis had started in Kurdistan. So I handed in my notice, and um, basically what happened, slightly surreal, so that's, okay, I've done that. I'm going to show you a video. So I handed in my notice. Just imagine the city has open plan office, lots of TV screens across the wall, they're all put onto the BBC. Some people at work have known that I've left, some people haven't. And so I... Oh, what did I do? Okay. This was my first day at work. So that was my first day, and I'll give you some background and story as to how that happened. Um, so I'd arrived at my new job uh, in Kurdistan, and I just left the city, so I turned up in my suits and heels, <laughs> red shellac nails, and there was no one there, so I went from room to room, and there was no one there, and then suddenly they all started coming in, and they looked at me, I said, it's my first day, what do I do? take those heels off, take that, put this t-shirt on and follow us. And the first morning of that day was um, a distribution in um, a school because a lot of people had been displaced and that particular morning we were um, supporting lots of Christians that were displaced and they were put into, everyone was put into makeshift buildings, schools, schools shut down for months um, to house displaced people while the camps were being built. And um, I walked in and I remember one moment where I just was taken back to my prison completely. The whole feeling of the place and the way, the looks on people's faces, it just took me back instantly. And I froze for a minute and didn't really know how to cope. And then I realized, okay, you're in work mode and came back and started working. And I, a journalist had reached out to me and um, asked to go on one of those helicopters. I didn't even know we were doing those helicopter missions because it was my first day. And nobody knew that there was 30,000 people trapped on the mountain because I'd just come from London. And so it took a time for me to figure out that we had those helicopter missions going to the mountain because there were 30,000 people trapped and ISIS had taken over the region and there was no other place to go apart from safety there, but it was completely hemmed by ISIS. And um, it was quite difficult to get on the helicopter, but we managed to get the call in at 10.30 at night to say, you're allowed to go on the helicopter now. Um, I'm a Kurdish girl from the region. Kurdish girls do not really drive out into ISIS territory without some form of security, or actually they just don't do it at night time. And so I was staying, I'd la landed and was staying with my auntie. I couldn't tell her what I was doing, so I, left my son and said, I'll be fine. Can you just find me some nail polish to get rid of my red shellac nails? <laughs> Which were actually a lifesaver because it made me completely think of them and not realize the danger that I was going into. Um, so I spent four hours of car journey trying to get them off and not figuring, we're driving into ISIS territory. Um, and so I left my aunties, said, look, I'm going for work, I'll be fine, just look after my son, and I'll be back in a few days. And so our family driver handed me over to one of the charity driver in a pickup truck that kind of went 40 miles an hour, and this journalist and two men that he didn't know, and he was going, what do I do? How am I handing you over to wherever you're going? We left, it took four hours, and at one point the driver stopped and said, I don't know which territory they've taken, I don't know whether to go right or left. I was so engrossed on getting my nails off, I just said, just go right, because it feels right. <laughs> Thank God it was right. Um, and then we arrived, and the pilot took us around what, the military helicopters, and he clearly outlined, he kept looking at me going, 
I don't think it should go on. I was the only Kurdish girl there. And he kept encouraging the other guys to go, and the journalist was like, no, she needs to come on. Um, but he pointed out very clearly we could die in three ways, and it was the helicopters will mal malfunction because it was old Soviet helicopters. Um, we would be, we could crash because of overloading from people. Um, you can't control the number of people that come on. Or you'd be shot by ISIS. Um, so you have four helicopters. You have two that go up and they shoot in defense, and then two that carry aid and they were shooting as well. So that's the shooting that you saw. And you deliver the aid to get rid of the weight, and then you hover and try and rescue as many people as you can. But you're only taking like 15, 16 people at a time. There was 30,000 people trapped, but it was really the only way of getting out at that time. And that's why people were scrambling on so desperately. Um, some really, really sad stories. That lady that was hanging, she was actually pregnant. Um, the, there was a guy there where um, he was crying and I thought he was injured, but when I went forward and asked him, he'd forgotten his child. And he thought that the, the grandma had taken the child on, but the grandma had been on. And so when he eventually realized there was no child there, and I still, to this day, do, do not know if they've been reunited. But you had lots of traumatic stories. So not only did you have traumatic stories of people that were held and taken by ISIS, but that whole experience on the mountain was really, really traumatic for everyone, too. Um, so that was, that was that. And then I spent 15 months out there working for Varanga Foundation. They built a camp. They built schools. They did lots of distributions. And I'm so grateful that I had that first-hand frontline experience with uh, a local organization. And it, it just gave me an experience. When I came back after 15 months, there was no way I could go back into a normal role, even though I did, but I did it after I set up a Lotus Flower. So I was very, very clear that I wanted to set up a Lotus Flower to support women and girls impacted by conflict and displacement because it kind of stems from my own childhood experience and it stems from the experience that I just had on the ground. Um, and it was my way of giving back and building a bridge between the two worlds that are, I guess, my home for both. And um, so I set it up in March 2016, so just registering. And then December 2016, our project started operating. And I started it in my living room with absolutely no money. I'm not rich, I'm not well connected. I, I just knew that I, I knew why I was doing it. And I was so passionate about the why that everything else was just, it will fall in place and we can figure out how to do it and get the right people in. So I didn't really think about the how. I just went, yes, I know why I'm doing it, so I'm doing it. And um, I got very, very lucky with my first donor who helped us to get our first project off the ground. And having that first project off the ground meant that we had space to um, implement it. And so we utilized that space with no money for the next year. So we started a volunteering program, but we started hiring people from within the camp because you've got displaced people, but they're all skilled. You know, they have skills and you can die in to do something because day to day there's nothing for you to do in those camps. And so the volunteering program was really successful. So our impact was growing. And then as that was growing, we ended up um, implementing more projects. Uh, so now, so we went from one, one center at the beginning, we've now got three centers. And for example, one of the camps um, is 15,000 people. We've had about five, we've supported around 5,000 women in that camp alone. We've got two other camps that are opening and the idea is that we open these women and girls centers inside camps because they're so desperately needed. And now we've become a bit more structured in the way that we implement projects. We've got SDG goals that we put them under. So education, livelihoods, mental health, well-being, human rights, peace building, and gender equality kind of goes through all of them. And then under those pillars, we have particular projects. For example, education, we'll have adult literacy, um, computer course, English uh, language, and they're very, very popular. For example, the adult literacy, most of the women in the camps are from rural regions and they've never been to a school, they've never picked up a pen. And for them to have the opportunity for the first time, it's, it's, phenomenal, it's phenomenal to see because they think, okay, well, I'm going to be here for a few years, I might as well learn how to read and write. 
or you know the livelihood programs we implement projects where all the skills that they learn not only can they utilize it in the camp that they're in now but when they go away to wherever they go they can still utilize those skills um, for example we're opening up we've opened up a, a social enterprise baking program where it's a little <coughs> cafe and they sell their products the sewing sisters program is we bring market linkages so local businesses to give the tailors um, opportunities to sew we are opening up a cafe because there's no social spaces like cafes for women and girls in camps we've got a boxing sisters program and the boxing one is becoming very popular but we hire instructors as well so we train the instructors and it's because it's very new in the region we train them up and then we hire them to implement the courses across the camps for the women and girls so it's asking them as well what kind of projects that they want but the whole aim is to provide them with tangible practical practical tools that they can use then and when they're away um, so to date we are in the program it says 5,000 <laughs> quickly jumped to 2,000 because we've had lots of other projects since then um, so they I mean as, as well as all the local stuff that we're doing we are doing very very big things and sometimes I have to pinch myself and remind myself how we how did we manage to do this um, but because we have access to so many women and stories and you know, human rights violations that have happened we came across a case when I first started in March 2016 with um, a woman that was held by a foreign fighter and that case basically propelled me to set up a pro bono team of lawyers and figure out a route for legal justice because as, as a genocide survivor the fact that I've not had justice or some form of recognition will always stay with you it will always feel like what's happening in your head just feels like a story because it wasn't officially recognized and something didn't officially happen so for me I've been adamant in trying to figure out a way okay even if it's something small what can we do to do something so what we're trying to do in this particular case is to set up um, global compensation scheme whereby the frozen assets of foreign fighters are redistributed to the victims now this doesn't really exist and it's virtually impossible but three years down the line we are still at it and i'm off to sydney next week where the foreign fighter is from um, for our first tribunal court hearing to figure out what the decision is i mean i'm sure it'll be continuing after that as well but the idea there is i want to take one or two, three specific cases where we can try and push it and set a precedent. And watch, once that precedent is set, then you can go for the wider community. Um, that's one. And then um, we are registering in the US and in Germany. We support survivors in Germany. And so we're hoping to implement some projects in Germany as well. Um, our centers are we're being asked to kind of set up centers like in Bangladesh and Cox's Bazaar. Um, to support the Rohingya women. Um, we, I have a massive fundraising target, so if anyone knows anyone, please let me know. <laughs> um, and the mental health technology app, and that is, again, that's come out of a need from our centres and our women and to figure out a way of supporting their needs. Um, and then when I do talks like this, everyone asks me, how can I help? So I try and throw pointers out there if anyone is interested, but it's doing talks, um, funding potentials, charity partners, community fundraising. For example, you amazing group of people could do something at the university to help fundraise in the name of Lotus. Um, we've got a fundraising hike in 2020. I don't know if anyone wants to be involved in that, but it's in Kurdistan. Um, so I think within time frame yeah, I hope so, <laughs> um, the so the takeaways from this and in terms of my own experience is I really really have embraced the great unknown and without realizing it I have and I think I've done that from not being scared or not letting fear take over I think fear is very natural but it's also going okay I, I can still do this despite being scared so recognizing that every single person can make a difference. I'm a very, very normal single mum, a struggling single mum, if you call it. But, you know, I started it in my living room with no money and nothing stopped me. And I wish I had a picture of how it started because it literally is A4 pieces of paper stuck on a wall. 
but it's believing and dreaming that you can actually make a difference. Whatever it is, you will look at your skills and figure out how you can make a difference, but I genuinely believe every single person can. And one big thing is, it's okay not to have the answers. I'm so comfortable with not having the answers because I know I'm not an expert in everything. And it's believing that actually you can surround yourself with the right people to help you and support you. And so it's, in a way, letting go of that ego and saying, it's okay not to have the answers. I'm completely comfortable with it. And I'm completely comfortable for things not starting out perfect. Like, you know, for example, my background was in digital project management, and so I'd worked for organizations that would build these massively beautiful websites, put so much money in. When we had our first website, it was heartbreaking for me, <laughs> considering I had 15 years of experience going, this is our website. <laughs> but I just had to let go and, you know, let go of that and say, it's all right for it to be like that because it's not going to be like that forever. It's, it, it's a journey. And um, don't shy away from big decisions. Sometimes we get so scared to make that big decision. And every decision that I've made is always very, very big. But I think I've developed such a knack in trusting myself and my intuition. I will instantly know whether it's a yes or a no. I'll just turn away. For example, we've just turned away a massive funding opportunity, a massive funding opportunity. But I had to stand firm in that decision because I know the outcome of that. And I know the outcome's not going to be great. And therefore, you have to go, no, this one comes first. And I'm comfortable making that decision despite losing all that money. And it goes back to being very, very defined with your values. Um, anything is possible. I, I, genuine, genuine believer of anything is possible. Anything, all my experiences that I've lived and felt, I do genuinely believe that anything is really possible. So it's not just the same. Um, give yourself that freedom to create it. Give yourself that freedom to make mistakes. Give yourself that freedom not to be right all the time. It's okay not to. Um, as long as you know, you take it with a positive attitude. And what I mean by that, it doesn't mean that you're going to have positive days every single day. It's all going to be well. It's not. You're going to face lots of obstacles. I faced so many obstacles. I could have stopped Lotus from day one because I thought, where's the funding going to come from? But actually, you have to be creative in finding solutions. And that's what's got me through, is really being creative and finding solutions and being resilient. Um, yeah, I think we're built on experience to, for fear. But again, I actually embrace fear. I kind of go, well, if, if it's there, then I need to find a way around it to see how I can make it work. So not being fear, fearful of fear is one of the greatest lessons that you can learn. And resilience, I think you just, you just make that decision to be resilient and then the tools kind of come into place. Um, and when I say tools, you'll find creative ways to find solutions for things. Um, and it will naturally come to you and let go of trying to control everything and knowing the answer to everything. Because that is a really, really big thing. Everyone expects things to have a perfect outline and to know exactly what you're going to do and it, that works for some people but actually you need to let go of a little bit of that and allow other people and trust other people to lead with some things and when you're genuine and authentic in your approach you will naturally just draw people in we've now got a massive army of lotus love supporters that will just give us that support and actually an organization we've helped 7,000 women and girls today we're running an organization that's half a million but we're actually functioning on a hundred thousand now that is all from a lot of kind people and a lot of pro bono support um, I know that that's not going to be sustainable so that's why my fundraising game is going up um, but we really didn't expect to expand so quickly in terms of the needs but we're being requested constantly for these projects and for the expansion on the ground because the need is so desperately there. So I hope that my talk has kind of inspired you some way to kind of go away and embrace the great unknown. It really is sometimes beautiful opportunities come out of that and you don't know what they are. Um, that's it, thank you and I can take some questions.